Does this look right? Close. Okay, that's 24. It's 10 in the room and 14 on the board. It's not a good ratio. Well, I, I don't write it on the, you know, I, I do this mainly for you guys. I want you to know that it matters. You guys know I care. Right? You know that it matters. So um, the lecture today, a lot depends on how much you recall from last summer. Do you have your notes from last summer? You have them with you? Do you guys have your notes from last summer with you? Well, I'm not surprised. I, I wouldn't carry around my notes from the previous semester. Do you guys remember lecture five? And lecture seven and lecture 11 last summer? Number five, we did a lot with Paris. Remember Paris? It was pretty solid. I'll, I'll show you some of the slides we had last summer. But um, your active engagement, reassuring me that you recall the main principles of these examples, will help us move into. The, the new material, the sweet spot, which is here. And I was telling some of the early arrivers that the stuff we've been studying, like the Anthropocene, many Colombia informal settlements, when you arrive in your first uh, jobs in architecture firms, they're going to look at you, and you say something about made in Colombia, they're going to look at you funny because they don't really recognize this topic of informal settlements made in Colombia. They don't really recognize it as a thing that's part of architecture because 
uh, they weren't taught this in school. So to the extent that uh, that perspective on the profession uh, becomes part of the profession, it will be because you guys make it so. Now, in contrast, this topic, you, when you arrive at your architecture firms, especially the older, the, the old farts in the firm, they will recognize this stuff because this is, this is how they were trained in architecture. This is the stuff that they, oh yeah, they'll be all excited about this topic. Um, so um, this will be a lot easier for you to talk to them about because they understand it. They're very excited about these guys here. Jan, Jan Giel, in particularly. And um, so there's two sides to this. When you talk about this topic of the lecture today, they will be excited. The other side of that is when they talk about these topics and you look at them quizzically, their response appropriately will be, I thought you said you went to college. I thought you said you went to architecture school. Everybody knows, everybody knows about this stuff, right? So they will expect you to be well-versed. They don't want to hear you say Jan Gell. They want you to pronounce his name right. So everybody say, repeat after me, Gill. I can't hear you, Gill. Jan Gill. Jan Gill. That's what it looks like, and that's what it sounds like, okay? And Anthropocene. Unless you're outside of the United States, in the, where they speak proper English, it's Anthropocene. Okay, okay. We, got, we got that down. So, um, a lot, uh, if our ability to get to those topics at the end will depend a lot on how much you recall from last summer. Um, remember that? So every architecture project, I'm, this is the same slide you got last summer, but I'm gonna present it differently given the different context and framing of the course. Every building that we design is really two architectural experiences. The one that we emphasize in the design studio is the experience of the building itself for the client from the client's perspective. But the urbanism perspective of architecture tells us that there is a second perspective uh, for every building, and that is, and there's a second architecture. The second architecture is the architecture produced by the ensemble of buildings. Uh, the architectural experience that is produced by those people who never enter the building. Because our building, the building that you design is part of a landscape and it either adds positively or detracts from that landscape. And this is where we get to the principle of the pepper spray test. Remember the pepper spray test? What's the pepper spray test? Right. So, like, the pepper spray is like a safety precautionary, like, tool. Yeah. Right. So, uh, how many of you come from Ruggles Station? Um, so, how many of you have come from Ruggles Station at night? So, um, so. Part of our professional obligation is to have empathy for all users of architecture. So even though there are only three women in the room, we have an ethical obligation to do our best. There are two things that we have an ethical obligation to do. 
is we have to take the perspective of all users, no matter who they are. User perspective. So, uh, and this is especially important for the men in the room. You need to embrace, you need to uh, adopt the user perspective through the exercise of empathy. Empathy is the first and most important ethical obligation of architecture. The second step is to uh, acknowledge with all humility that no matter how imaginatively, no matter how close you are with your sister, your mother, your best friend who's a woman, no matter how well you, uh, you imagine that perspective, you can't imagine that perspective, right? So you understand with all humility that you, your ability to imagine the user perspective is limited. So you constantly imagine what the situation is for other users, and then every chance you get, you, you ask them, you ask the question, you, you, uh, you engage with curiosity. Um, did I get that right? So did I get that right, the pepper spray test? Did we get this right? Do, um, when you when you walk out of Ruggles Station at night, you don't turn left and cut through the Alice Hayward Taylor apartments, right? Or do you? Sometimes. If it's light out, what do you do if it's dark? Yeah, you take the long way. Why? Do you guys get those alerts? Gunshots fired? Where do those gunshots get fired? Hmm? Where? Enunci Enunciation Road, yeah. So, um, you're smart, you're paying attention, you don't want to get hurt, you don't walk through Alice Hayward Taylor, I don't care how macho you are, uh, in appearance or in actuality, if you're black belt in karate, gun is always going to win. And so you walk, you walk through uh, Northeastern, and then you turn left, and you're walking down uh, Parker Street, right? You're just walking down Parker Street, and to the left of you is William Ron's uh, West Campus, West Village dormitories, lots of windows, lots of eyes on the street. Right, so I might have forgotten my pepper spray at home today. It doesn't matter. There's, I'm safe, right? Even though across the street there's that parking lot in the soccer field, um, which is a little dangerous because it's not it's not a surveilled site. But on this side, at least I have the windows of the dormitory, and then I get to Ruggles Street, and I'm waiting there at the light, and I'm okay still. But now I cross street and I have the, the Orthodox Church on the left. You can picture it. Yeah, the Orthodox Church is a little reassuring. It's close to the street, but it's closed. No one's there. And on the, this side, there's that front lawn of Wentworth. Uh, I'd rate it, you know, maybe my awareness, my, my fear scale goes up, quivers around four out of 10. And then I'm walking along. And then I'd get, okay, Ira Allen, that's pretty good. But Watson Hall, oh, that parking lot? The parking lot, so parking lots raise the fear scale. Um, then Watson Hall has a dead facade. Ira Allen on this side, that's okay. Um, Annex Central is pretty good. Let's say I'm walking, I'm continuing down Parker. Uh, t uh, it used to be a tennis court there and not the CEIS building. The tennis court, bad. Then Tansy Gym. How many windows are in Tansy Gym? Uh, <laughs> yeah, there's no eyes on the street. And now I'm walking in front of the extension of Alice Hay I'm crossing the Annunciation Road, Alice Hayward Taylor, Tansy Hall. And then you get to the, the west lot, the Parker Street lot. You know, I am reaching for that pepper spray. 
very little of Parker Street passes the pepper spray test because of the lack of eyes on the street. So the two experiences of the CEIS building by Lear's Weinsaffel, the two experiences, one is when you walk into it, but the more important experience is how it contributes to the architecture of Parker Street. So how does that building contribute to the experience of Parker Street? What do you guys think of it? Yeah. Yeah. It's a wall of glass and there's activity there late into the evening. Excellent. Thank you, Lears Weinsaffel. Even if I never enroll as a student at Wentworth, uh, I am a user of the architecture of Lears Weinsaffel. And I'm grateful to Lears Weinsaffel for considering the user perspective of people walking past, um, sometimes in conflict with the express interests of the client. Uh, so I don't know what Wentworth said to them about what they should be doing, but um, Wentworth has a history of not being the best client in the world for architecture. There's Weinsaffel. I, I, usu I usually teach in studio that uh, the architect really can't do uh, good architecture unless the client allows them uh, to do good architecture. I now have to reconsider that statement. I know what kind of client Wentworth is. Wentworth puts a limit on good architecture. Lears Weinsaffel produced a building far in excess of what the normal relationship with Wentworth as a client would produce. It's truly a remarkable achievement, and I'm really impressed with Lears Weinsaffel. Um, Tom Chung was, I, have you had Tom as an instructor? Anyway. So this is an important perspective to complicate and expand the normal, the, the, it's normal for the past 50, 60 years. The normal perspective is, of architecture is it's about the building, full stop. It's about the building, it's about the building, it's about the building are the three most important things about architecture. But the urbanism perspective complicates that and says it's not just about the building. As a matter of fact, the building is secondary to the effect it has on the larger architectural environment. And that is an ethical perspective of architecture and urbanism that is uh, prevalent in the rest of the world, but the tradition of North American architectural education has very much curtailed uh, the capacity of the profession to consider that larger perspective. And uh, since the 60s, architects uh, have been pushing back against that limitation and pushing the field of architecture into larger, larger perspectives. So that it's not just about satisfying the wealthy client's uh, uh, limited list of perceived needs and actually serving the larger interests of society. And so this is a constant tug of war and a struggle that is part of every professional life uh, in architecture. So here's examples from the Renaissance and Baroque periods um, in Italy, uh, in Rome, of the architecture of the outdoor room. So in the 60s and 70s, we started talking about the design of outdoor rooms as one of the most important uh, problems to address in architecture. And these are examples of, when we study this architecture, we do not look at the architecture uh, inside these buildings because it's not remarkable. The real event here is Michelangelo's brilliant assemblage of architectural facades. Michelangelo looked at what does the architecture of the outdoor room need from us as designers? And based on that analysis of the architecture of the outdoor room, uh, Michelangelo designed these facades and these buildings to hold up those facades to fulfill the needs of that architecture of the outdoor room. 
So that's a very uh, interesting and powerful perspective uh, of architecture. Similarly here, you see Bernini's design of the forecourt uh, to St. Paul's Cathedral, the Vatican, and Rome. Uh, it's all about the framing of this outdoor room, which on Easter Sunday, et cetera, uh, becomes the most important cathedral in Catholicism when the Pope comes out on the balcony and addresses the gathered masses of Catholics uh, visiting Rome. And both of these examples use forced perspective. It turns out that humans, when confronted with a view, let's say, of a rectangular space, um, the human eye brain system assumes that these two walls are parallel. And uh, so based on that physiological uh, response to a view, the Michelangelo and Bernini use forced perspective to trick the, the, the physiological system of the eye brain into believing that these walls are parallel. And so by doing so, it exaggerates the scale of whatever's at the end of that corridor. So this is called forced perspective. And I think we, did, did we do that? Yeah. <clears throat> and we talked about this, that uh, Catholics visiting Rome on pilgrimage, they get bonus miles if they, uh, they get time off from purgatory if they do the pilgrimage. And this was a pamphlet that guided uh, pilgrims through Rome so they could visit the seven holy sites of Rome. Uh, and, and so in order to facilitate that pilgrimage visitation, the original tourism, they trans Sixtus V transformed the city of Rome by cutting these boulevards through the city to open up the viewpoints. And you guys know what comes next because you remember the whole Paris lecture that Haussmann repeated what had been done throughout history. Uh, Haussmann said, uh, let's cut boulevards through the city of Paris. Remember this? Let's cut boulevards through the city of Paris to create these long view corridors with, with important architectural monuments at the end. And at the same time, we get the retrofit water supply sewer systems. Uh, we have this problem of political revolution constantly uh, toppling the regimes of Paris and France. So let's, uh, let's, re let's get rid of these narrow alleyways, these narrow streets, so that we can move troops rapidly through the streets. Also, and here's uh, something where moving back in history, the, it wasn't um, US government racist policy that invented this, put a, uh, uh, ghettoize a population by restricting their ability to live uh, outside of the ghetto. Uh, isolate them in the ghetto and then build your freeways right through that ghetto to displace them, right? That wasn't invented by the US government. Uh, Hausman did it and before him, others did it. It's a strategy of slum clearance and to gentrify the city. New train stations, we talked about this last week, I mean last, this week, last Wednesday. The trains come in to where the medieval wall exists and stop because it's too expensive to replace. There's another train station coming in from here, another one coming in from there, from Lyon and uh, Gare du Nord. And so that's where the trains come in and they stop and there's no way to connect, just like in Boston. There's no uh, north-south. So remember this, this is the slums. You cut a boulevard through it and you put a, a thin layer of architecture on either side of the boulevard uh, to make the city uh, safe for gentrification. This, at the time, was seen as a portrayal of harsh segregation. The servants at the street level, 
the wealthy one percenters uh, living at the Piano Nobile in Renaissance uh, language, the main residential floor, high ceilings. The Piano Nobile is an important thing in creating legibility. Uh, when you're in cities where the fabric is um, prior to uh, World War II, you will see that <coughs> the level above street level in the rest of the world, they call this the first floor. Isn't that interesting? So on the first floor, the Piano Nobile, the high ceilings, the large windows, uh, that's where the one percenters live. And then the 19 percenters, the architects uh, and everyone else, us, we live up here. We have families, we work. And then, uh, then we get to the 80 percenters, uh, the people who rent and they struggle to pay the rent. <coughs> you say, I don't have the money. And then we have uh, the, the truly impoverished, the starving artists, uh, the destitute who are living in the unheated, uninsulated uh, attic, the worst possible situation in the city. Um, until recently when these places sell for a million dollars you know, in Paris, et cetera. So you remember this section? I think a lot of you do. And it, uh, the art of the period represents the transformation of the fabric of the city to make it a place for strolling of the 1% and the 19%. We dress up in our best clothes and it's like going to the mall when you're in high school. You don't go there to shop, you go there to see other people strolling and to be seen. It's a social exercise. It's a performance of status and prestige. Who went to high school? Oh, everybody did. So you understand how status and prestige works. So Paris was transformed, parks, boulevards, That's a slide that wasn't in there before. That's a good one. So Paris, not just Paris, but the landscape around Paris, the surrounding areas were all uh, transformed according to these principle of sight lines. And as we get to the end of the lecture, the fundamental principle that is being demonstrated by this is that the formation of the city is related to the physiological system of humans. The eye-brain physiology is such that uh, humans respond positively to uh, the messages and the experiences that are available to them in the built environment. When we're walking down the street and we're in the crosswalk and, and we glance up and we go, oh my goodness, and there's this corridor that shoots all the way to some monument in the distance, there is a brain, eye brain, body response that is generally positive. And so the view corridors are something, is a set of principles that have guided the design of cities for good and for evil uh, throughout history, as we'll see with Hitler's Berlin. Uh, but the thing to remember is that it's a powerful experience that we create in the design of the cities. And the Opera House. The Paris Opera House, you remember this. Repeated in Hanoi, Vietnam. Repeated in Vienna. Repeated in Casablanca. Repeated in Vietnam. So we got that, the visual axes. We're good. And then there's a the whole thing in Chicago. Remember Chicago? The white architecture of the 1893 World Columbian Exposition that created this, uh, that revived in plaster and chicken wire these temporary constructions to produce this scenographic effect. So it's not about the architecture as much as it is about producing this space between the buildings. These are facades built uh, in temporary materials. 
uh, that produces uh, an experience of space that transforms our understanding of who we are as a society. This architecture was the basis of uh, a, a principle, a, a cultural transformation um, of the United States into the torchbearer of human civilization. So for the first time, instead of just emulating, constantly emulating Europe, European trends and European thought, this was uh, uh, the assertion of a principle that Europe used to be the, the foremost uh, torchbearer of human civilization. That torch has now been passed on to the United States. And here in Chicago, we are ready to take up that torch and carry it forward as the vanguard of human societies uh, because we are now the leaders of the whole world. And that led to a set of civic principles, uh, an urban plan by David uh, Daniel Burnham uh, for the plan of Chicago. And uh, it, was pro it was produced with funding from um, a social organization that uh, it was the principles and the values, the social values that were embedded in this vision of the future of Chicago were so strong and so clear, it was translated from urban plan and architectural plan into a textbook for high schoolers. And up to as recently as the 1980s, this was a required textbook in the public schools of Illinois. Uh, and so you will meet people from Chicago who had this as their textbook. It was a set of civic principles that uh, were part of a translation of the Chicago plan by Daniel Burnham, an architect. And this went on uh, to spark, even though it had, its, it had its names, you know, you could have called it mannerism, you could have called it Beaux-Arts, uh, you could have called it the architecture of Rome from Sixtus V. In this new uh, revival of these principles of visual corridors, it got a new name. It was called the City Beautiful Movement. And so the City Beautiful Movement uh, swept through the United States. It hit Chicago first, but in the aftermath of the Chicago plan, it was so successful that it went directly to Washington, D.C where the Baroque Mannerist city planning principles of the visual corridor were revived in a new plan because a train station had interrupted these visual corridors. The, the planning of Washington, D.C. kind of went haywire, and so they had to revive the principles and come up with a new plan for the city of Washington, D.C. San Francisco. Uh, had its civic center. So this, were, this was a proposal for cutting boulevards through San Francisco by Daniel Burnham. Um, and the only part that was actually executed, actually none of this was executed, but along Venice, uh, there was a new civic center produced uh, with the city hall, the library, and this corridor. Does anyone know San Francisco? Yeah? Been. Um, I worked on a project in the 1980s that was a revival of this revival uh, with the IM Pam partners. Uh, we produced a library that very much built on the principles of the City Beautiful Movement. Uh, and this is Cleveland, Ohio, which has one of the clearest manifestations of this City Beautiful. Uh, set of principles uh, in its civic center. Um, also, a good example of what happens in the iBrain system, right, when you match the buildings pixel for pixel, right? It looks like, it looks like someone spray painted these buildings and then sent up a drone and took a photo of it because uh, there's such precision in the matching of the image pixel for pixel, but it makes it a very vivid and powerful portrayal. Step one was the grain out of the automobile parking lot landscape. So you suppress 
all of the, all of that, and then you bring this into full color, then you uh, do these buildings. And the thing that, that works here very well is the legibility of form as in contrast with the space is crucial for maintaining the legibility of the image. Any questions about that? Because this is kind of one of the things we struggle with in the analysis. It takes more time, but it's a very effective strategy. Is it, a Bing maps image? it might be a Bing Maps. It doesn't it looks like Bing Maps, doesn't it? I think it is. And we talked about how it swept through the United States and then it went through uh, other places as well in the colonial world. Okay, we're good with City Beautiful. So you'll notice that what is, where did this name come from? Yeah, Ebenezer Howard, and we're about to look at that. There was a Garden City. So that part of the name come is a reference to Ebenezer Howard. But what we just did here was City Beautiful. So there's this other thing going on here. Because it's a combination of town and country. So it's got the, the city that functions on its own, and it has a town that functions or the country that functions on its own, but they mingle together within this new uh, mm -hmm. city. Mm -hmm. Anyone else? Okay, well, it's not the complete answer. That's, we're on the way to the answer. Um, but let's see, I'll check in again in a bit. <coughs> you, you saw this in the reading. And I think we did this last summer too, right? Talked about the Garden City. I'm actually not sure. And you didn't take that course. <coughs> so Ebenezer Howard was not trained as an architect. He was not trained as a planner. Back when he was writing, there was no separation between architecture and planning. It was one thing. Architects planned cities. Uh, it was only since then, and in part because of Ebenezer Howard, that architecture split away from planning and urban design as two different professions. And that turned out to be a mistake. And your jobs are to continue the process of bringing it back together. Uh, thus, the concentration of urbanism to help you with that. Ebenezer Howard was not trained. He was just uh, an amateur. And when you hear the word amateur, you tend to think, um, yeah, not very good, right? But throughout the history of civilization, some of the most significant uh, and crucial turning points come from people from outside of the professions that they transform. And architecture and planning is one of the most vivid demonstrations of that. Remember the Crystal Palace, 1851? Uh, Crystal Palace was uh, a revolutionary piece of architecture designed by a botanist. He was not trained as an architect, and yet he invented the thing that is still uh, all the rage today, which is the metal frame and glass, steel and glass buildings. He invented that. He was a botanist, not a trained architect. Uh, here's another example. Um, 
he was not trained in much of anything. I think he was an actuarial. It says in the reading, I can't remember. But uh, here he is. He's, he's not drawing towns. He's drawing diagrams of towns. But he is still alive when, uh, in England, uh, they commission the new town of Letchworth, England. And it's termed a garden city. Um, but it has a low population density, so it's not quite a city, it's more of a town. And you can see it's a low density suburb of London with a town center, uh, these visual axes that lead to a civic center. Uh, the, rail, the railway station, um, so that people can walk to the railroad, railway station and commute into London. Uh, and so this is a very, very low density version of the Garden City idea. Uh, and here's more Letchworth. Um, one of the ideas is that you keep the houses close to the street. And I'm saying street, not road, uh, because it's not just for cars, it is for people, baby carriages, bicycles, cars, delivery vehicles, etc. And by keeping the houses close, you open up this shared, first a private garden, and then a shared uh, grove of trees in the middle of the block. It is an extremely inefficient way to develop if you are trying to maximize the square footage of the land you can sell, but it's an extremely a uh, powerful way to develop if you want to increase the value of every lot that you're developing. The value of this lot goes up because of the access to that shared realm. It's kind of like the Central Park principle. Um, uh, since, Central Par since the real estate around Central Park, here's, this is a, a real estate value puzzle. The, the highest value of real estate, we'll stay away from Harlem for the moment, because it hasn't quite been totally gentrified yet. Um, and we'll, we'll start in uh, around, on the west side, we'll start around 96th Street. Uh, yeah, 96th Street. <clears throat> Do you know New York? Who knows New York? Okay, so this is some of the most valuable real estate in the world it is so valuable that every 10 years or so a real estate developer gets cozy with the mayor of New York and says hey man uh, this is such valuable real estate how about if we how about if we develop how about if we open up some of Central Park to develop it how about it think of the fortune that would be generated by that. And in 1986, it was this, um, this very flamboyant developer by the name of, I think it was Donald Trump, who proposed this to the mayor of New York. And, and New York was going through a lot of financial difficulties. So it became actually a tempting prospect. Uh, while we're at it, why don't we just develop all, what, 6,000 acres of Central Park, think of the real estate revenue that would be generated. But that is ignoring the principle of, uh, of the source of the value of this land. The value of this land, the reason that this real estate is more valuable than this real estate here is because of Central Park. And so economists have done this exercise um, how much, what percentage of the value, uh, the difference in value between this zone and this zone is due to the proximity of Central Park? And so this thought exercise is part of the logic of the Garden City as developed in Letchworth. And so this is, this was not actually part of Ebenezer Howard's diagram. Uh, there was no scale where he talked about 
uh, housing and buildings around the street edge and um, a, some kind of park landscape in the center. That was not part of the original diagram, but in the execution in Letchworth Garden City in England, uh, it was part of that logic. And so it became an important part of the principles associated with what we call Garden City, which is really garden towns, which is really what became suburbia, right? The idea that the benefits of the city and the benefits of the country, you get the best of both worlds, suburbia, right? Who grew up in suburbia? Only Will? Oh, come on. Who grew up in suburbia? No? Where? Okay. So we don't have suburban kids here? Child, children of suburbia? Did your parents commute into work somewhere? Yeah, okay. So is, so this question is for those of us who grew up in suburbia. Is suburbia the best of both worlds? The best of the city and the best of the countryside together, suburbia. Who's with me? Who says not so much? Okay, Jake's over here. So, why was it so great? Uh, I mean, you were kind of close enough to the city where you could drive in or take like, a train in, mm -hmm. but you were also far enough away where you traffic a lot of people yeah just like in an area yeah okay what was not so great about suburbia I like being in a city I don't really care for my own space or like my backyard mm -hmm. I'd rather just live in an apartment mm -hmm. yeah. personal taste I'd rather taste. walk out my door and there'd be a restaurant right there mm -hmm. yeah, I found myself going to the city every as much as I could mm -hmm. in high place. school yeah how far away was it well, I mean, I'm in the city of Chicago, but I'm like towards the outskirts of it. So, uh -huh. so it's kind of like in between the suburbs and the heart of the city. So it's kind of like. And had you ever heard of the Wacker textbook? I mean, from class in the summer. You, you heard of it? No, no, not before. Okay. Yeah. Okay, Connor, what do you say? Sounds great. Well, yeah, I, I enjoy it. Okay. Uh, but I think it has its like best parts, and then the city has its best parts, and I don't think the two really intermingle with mm -hmm. each other very much. I mm -hmm. think they're two like very separate things. I think life in the city is a whole lot different than life in like a suburban like. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so the, because uh, one of the benefits of teaching the course backwards is we can now just very quickly list what some would say are the unintended consequences of suburban, the suburban thing that was triggered by Ebenezer Howard's ideas. And others would say, yeah, maybe in the minds of the original conception of suburbia, it was an unintended consequence. But if you're paying attention, you very clearly notice in the first few months, if not years, of this 80, or it's probably a century of suburbanization now, uh, it takes a special kind of lack of empathy and unprofessionalism to ignore the negative impacts of suburbanization. Um, let's start with racial segregation. 
the suburbanization of the United States was an instrument of segregation and differential financing for educational opportunities in the United States because uniquely in the entire developed world, only the United States funds education through local property taxes. Um, and so it's racial segregation that also is educational segregation um, as a de facto uh, consequence. Then um, the automobile congestion. So congestion is an inevitable uh, part of the package deal of suburban suburbanization is that the geometry of cars Cars take a lot of space when they're parked, they take a lot of space when they're in motion, and they produce a spread out landscape that reinforces itself, reproduces itself, uh, such that uh, you have no option. If you want to participate fully in society and its economic and social opportunities, you either have a car and you participate, or you don't have a car and you don't participate. Right. So conge the logic, the geometry of congestion, and since we are the masters of the geometry of these things, this is very much something on our plate. And then third, uh, as part of that, there's the whole thing of climate change, that um, the, to the extent that we care about the climate change crisis that you face as we approach peak human, fully one third of the carbon pumped in the atmosphere so far is from uh, automobile, private automobile usage. So, um, and when you are looking at the lead, the cute little lead standards, uh, and this is something I think will come up again, but just in case it doesn't, um, Wentworth is building a new dorm, and it's going to be a passive house, the first high-rise passive house in, on the East Coast. Hooray, Wentworth. Uh, but, and it's going to go for lead silver rating, because that's all we do. We don't go for gold, and we certainly don't go for platinum. We're more of a, a third-rate school in our own minds. <laughs> and so, we wouldn't expect them to put in any effort for us. No worries. They do what? We wouldn't expect them to put in any effort for us. Right, uh, which is the right expression because it is for you, your generation. You know, the, the administration will be dead uh, when the, ri the oceans rise to smother the campus. Um, so, uh, so the lead, have you, who's worked with the lead standards? Some of you might even be registered lead. Um, how much do you count the embodied energy of the building materials? What about the carbon produced by the concrete? Right, so, uh, and what about the, uh, the accommodation of the automobile? So the lead standards are so narrowly conceived that they rule out the actually the majority of the impacts of a building are not part of the LEED standard. And so it turns out that in the 70s, Peter Calthorpe and a few others, and Peter Calthorpe will come up at the end of the lecture, if we get there. Um, so let's say you put solar panels and windmills uh, on the top of your house, and you create a house that has zero zero carbon contributions. It's off the grid, but it's not in the city. And you compare that to an old house with leaky insulation in the windows, uh, but it's in the city. This is outside of the city. We assume a family of 2.2 uh, children and two uh, working parents, and so there are two cars. Let's say two cars. I'm drawing quickly two cars. So there are two cars at this house that is net zero emissions. And here's a leaky uh, apartment building in the city um, where uh, because it's in the city, 
um, uh, one person has a car in the household and the other person you know, walks, bicycles, takes the tea, whatever. Which of these, and it's this leaky, it's, it, it's a leaky building, you have to heat it with steam, all of these old systems. Which building is more ecologically uh, efficient? You can tell where this is going, right? So in the 1970s, when they studied this, this wins. The amount of energy used by one of those two cars is more than enough to offset all the savings of a net zero building. So go ahead, make your net zero buildings, but don't delude yourself or others. The transportation implications of the building that you build is as much or a bigger factor in the ecological profile of the building itself. Not even talking about the embodied energy of building a new building versus adaptive intervention, reusing of a, an existing historic building. Very sobering, very humbling for those of us who are architects. So, um, so that's the large, larger package. Um, how many people were able to watch the video of the automobility lecture last week? How many people didn't realize that was an expectation? So, okay, I'll try to, instead of putting it in the second half of the first sentence of a three sentence email, I'll put it in the first half of the first sentence of a three sentence email. Mm. Or I'll just, just write, I'll just send, I don't know, I'll, I'll try to accommodate uh, the communication limitations of our age. So that's why I have to go into this a little bit. This is covered at length in the automobility lecture. Um, so in the spirit of that, coming out of the Letchworth, this is a really interesting example of something called uh, the neighborhood unit. And this is going to resonate with um, some of the things that we get into later in the lecture, where in the old scenario, we put in, there's a main street that cuts through the middle of town, uh, becomes Main Street, might be the Boston Post Road for those of us who grew up in the suburbs of New England. And there's a post office, a town hall, a cinema, a pharmacy, et cetera, and that's Main Street. In this conception, and so the main street <coughs> emerged in the pre-automobile era. As soon as you start, uh, <coughs> as soon as the traffic moves from three miles an hour walking to six mile an hour horse-drawn carts to uh, slow moving vehicles to faster moving vehicles to really fast moving vehicles, you have to start running a bypass road around the town so that the high-speed traffic on the highway doesn't come shooting down Main Street. And so in the period of the automobile, instead of um, taking the main highway and building, making that Main Street, instead of that being the center, the neighborhood unit, because of the automobile, shifts that. They put the main streets at the edges of the neighborhood. They put the civic center away from the higher speed, higher volume traffic. And this becomes, the, it's, a, it's a flipping inside out of the urban form. So that the pedestrians, the, the, the faster traffic, heavier traffic, is kept on the boundaries. And the center is for people and slower moving vehicles and narrower streets to um, signal that the expectation is that you don't go so fast. And so that becomes the basis of the neighborhood unit. Oh, there it is. Uh, the neighborhood unit idea. And notice these green areas in mid-block. That's part of it as well. And, uh, and so in this conception, taken to its logical extreme, we get one of uh, my favorite uh, ideas of all time 
which is the Radburn Garden City idea um, that comes out of these ideas in 1929, where uh, every house has two sides to it. There's the street side, and then on the what we think of as the back is the yard side, and that connects to this green area that's shared in mid-block. And another way of thinking of it, especially if we go back in time to 1929, what was the social family structure of suburbs in 1929 in the United States? The man uh, gets in his car or walks to the train station and goes to work. And so there's a male side that is uh, the street, and then there's a female side. Uh, the, the women of the household take care of the children, and the children are kept away from the male side of the automobile. So there's a male and female side to every house. There's two fronts. There's a male front that faces the driveway and the street, and a female front that faces the green garden realm of the pedestrian, non-motorized uh, walking to the school. And so even when the children reach school age, every morning I wake up, I fix my husband his bacon and eggs, I make sure he gets off to work, and then I take my kids, I walk my kids to school. Right, beautiful. And so the principle that uh, comes through this, and yeah, I'm planting the seed for what we get to in the end, where Jan Giel, that's how you pronounce his name, uh, is saying the most important uh, test of the success of an urban environment is what's it like for the children and for the elderly. They are the indicator species of our environments. And that idea is not from Jan Giel, it uh, was very prevalent at this point in 1929 with the neighborhood unit <coughs> with Clarence Stein. It is all about what is the quality of experience for the children. So if the children are over here and they need to get to the school, how do they get to the school without having to put themselves, their bodies in the way of these fast moving mail driven vehicles? We, do, we started doing back in 1929 what we have done since for antelope and moose on highways, right? You know how deer cross the highway and get hit by cars? So now we put wildlife corridors below or above highways so that the migratory patterns of wildlife doesn't put our drivers in jeopardy because who's hit an animal on the highway? Yeah, is it any fun? No. Yeah, it's no fun. So we studied the habitat and the patterns of animals and we created these underpasses. But Jan Giel is quick to point out, we have studied extensively the habitat and the needs and the behavioral patterns and the environmental behavioral pattern uh, connections for all kinds of species, but not so much humans. And so, um, it's not exactly true. This is an example of studying the environmental behavioral uh, interplay of humans. How does human life uh, thrive or struggle uh, depending on their environmental conditions? This is an example of having studied that and scientists have noticed, scientists or actually architects have noticed that the human species, especially the younger human species, thrive when you give them safe routes to schools. And notice, at this age, I don't have to walk them to school anymore. Mom stays home uh, because they're independent. And so this is the Radburn plan. This is the ideas of the Radburn plan. Uh, and you see. Uh, these, this extensive pedestrian network mid-block. Uh, there's the school. This is the same block that we were just looking at. Um, and so there's a plan 
where you see every house has a car side and a, a, a male side with the car and a female side with pedestrian access for the mother and the children to get them to school. And if this had been continued, this is the same exact site, that's the same exact school, if this had continued, this is the pattern that was planned. But uh, what happened in 1929? The stock market crash and the Great Depression. So when you're walking down the street and uh, you want to impress people, you can identify things based on this knowledge. You can identify things that were built in the 20s because there was a huge building boom in the 20s. And the things that were built in the 40s. Why wasn't anything built in the 30s? Great Depression, all over the world. So it's a great party trick to say, if it's uh, human scaled, if it tends to be human scaled, yeah, that was built in the 1920s. If it's automobile scaled, yeah, that was built in the 40s, 50s, or 60s. So that was the garden suburbs. So just a quick check-in. I think we did this whole Hitler used the visual corridors as an instrument of power. He used design. Hitler was an art student. He applied to architecture school and was rejected. He wasn't good enough for architecture school. So he took over Europe and showed them a thing or two. He designed the uniforms. He designed what some people claim is uh, one of the most effective public relations campaign uh, in the 20th century. Some say he invented the freeway. And I like that idea. I like to blame him for all the evil things that uh, destroyed our planet. Um, the Volkswagen car, here he is uh, breaking ground on a freeway project. Um, and then he, he hired a bunch of architects to redesign the city of Berlin to be the capital of the world for a thousand years was the plan. And so everything was very big. And it was so important to him that when they found his dead body in the bunker, he was in a bunker uh, that was connected by an underground hallway to an adjacent room that had the model of the city of Berlin uh, as he conceived it. Right, we looked at this. Uh, he and his architects designed, used classical revival architecture as an instrument of producing power, the use of the searchlights uh, shining up into the sky to emulate the pattern of columns. Architect Albert Speer had worked out plans and models for Berlin's redevelopment since 1936. You are looking at the central part of the construction project, the north-south axis, an area of around six kilometers with the Great Hall at the top corner of the picture. This new structure would have ripped through Berlin's cityscape. The start at its lower end would have formed the gigantic south rail. Here's the inside. Remember, did I show this, right? And so this is the interior of the Great Hall as uh, visualized in the uh, series Man in the High Castle. They did a fantastic job of, uh, I guess through CGI, computer graphics, of recreating it's hard to see in this resolution, but that short shot, it, there's about 10,000 people just standing on the floor. This dome would have been taller than the Empire State Building. So by far the tallest dome ever built. So here's another hint. You remember we talked about Corbusier's Radiant City? Another hint at what's going on here? Radiant, Garden City, City Beautiful, Radiant, Radiant City. So it's really the, the play of three distinct 
planning and design, urban design concepts uh, pushed together into a single term. And so we learned about the invention of zoning because remember industry was polluting and so you check the wind direction and then you put industry downwind from uh, the town center and you, um, you preserve, this was the dawn, this was the, modernism was also the invention of historic preservation. So you preserve the old town, you build a new industrial center and then you uh, create a new town uh, uh, upwind from it and this infrastructure zone separates the new town from the industry. And because it used to be the center of, everything used to be in this human scale old town, that the railway line, of course, runs through the old town before it was important to separate them. And we get the whole racial segregation as part of zoning. So zoning wasn't invented in order to produce racial segregation but it was a convenient instrument available for planners in the 20th century to, uh, to implement racial segregation. And now we get to Corbusier's, um, so planning and zoning was an important prerequisite for uh, Corbusier's radiant city ideas. You remember this redonk plan where it's one huge building, but because of the, saw the square tooth uh, aspect of the plan, it appears to be building, garden, building, garden. It has the appearance of separate buildings, um, separated by gardens, even though it's one continuous building. So this is uh, a demonstration of this attitude where architects don't just design the building, uh, in and of itself for its own purposes, as an object, as an experience, they design the, the collection of buildings uh, as part of the architectural experience of moving through the built environment. And the print, the, you remember all this. Ask a question. You remember that? The skip stop elevator idea that this is a unit, a two level unit, and this is a two level unit, and you are, have more efficient use of uh, space because the elevator, there's only a corridor every third floor. And so um, it's a much more efficient way to uh, design. You got that? And now we get to the streets in the air idea that was part, uh, it was pioneered previously, but Corbusier was the master of taking ideas from elsewhere and redeploying them uh, with great impact um, in his own architecture. And so he, <coughs> he developed this radiant city idea um, that in the 20s, that was designed to replace these, uh, these congested cities of the pre-war period with these um, similar density, similar population density, but a new configuration with much, much more open space. And then we have the idea of solar orientation. The ideal solar orientation is to have the rising sun here, the setting sun there, and uh, you, you protect your southern facade from overexposure to the sun, and so this is the ideal. And so no matter what the pattern, the block and lot pattern of your city, you have to correct it so your buildings are slabs oriented north-south. And can you think of any place that was produced according to those ideas? Yeah. So public housing in the United States uh, in the aftermath of urban renewal uh, was designed on the Xilinbao solar orientation model 
which the most important thing about this for our purposes is that it replaced streets like we used to uh, in the old way of making cities we have streets and street walls so this is the human scale and maybe there are cars parked and cars flowing anyway this is the experience so in terms of outdoor room, the production of outdoor rooms, you know, with trees, um, this was seen as out, out of, outmoded. And so we had to get rid of this, and instead we have uh, housing as an architectural object placed in the park. And instead of streets, we have motorways that pass through this forest of architectural objects. And so instead of uh, the outdoor room of the street, we now have motorways passing through the object building landscape. And instead of parks, this was called the tower in the park idea, but with the rise of the automobile, it went from tower in the park to tower in the park king la. And so, uh, in terms of pepper spray test human experience, uh, the experience of the street suddenly becomes precarious and dangerous, whereas um, here we have eyes on the street, um, and it's safer. Questions about this? I am compressing uh, whole lectures worth of material in one slide at a time here, so there's a lot going on. If Paris had been bombed, it would have been rebuilt according to these ideas. Um, the cities that were bombed in Europe were rebuilt according to these ideas. Uh, Corbusier developed these ideas in the 1920s. Then he was one of the founders of something called Siam. Have you heard of Siam? What is SIAM? SIAM is an acronym. What does it stand for? Here's a hint. It's an acronym for a name in French. You can say the English version of it. It's the international Congress of m m modern architecture. So the International <coughs> Congress of Modern Architecture was formed in 1927 to look at what is the highest quality, smallest apartment humanly possible. It was, it was a competition uh, of modern architects all around the world. How do we produce the best, smallest architecture so that we can reduce the costs and spread the benefits of modernism to the most people? So this was in the spirit, believe it or not, the early modern spirit was driven by a need to have the, the most benefits, the highest benefits to the most number of people. It was very much a social mission. The ethics of modern architecture was such that whatever it takes to bring the most benefits to the most people. And that was what drove this. Here you see this uh, very bizarre scale shift from the human scale to the automobile scale uh, with the splitting, the protecting of the humans Let's protect the humans away from the car traffic. But this rarely worked out. This, so these are the ideas that led to pedest separating pedestrians from automobiles. Sounds great until you do it. Uh, and so, the International Congress of Modern Architecture 
took Corbusier's urbanism ideas of the 1920s. Uh, they had their first meeting in 1927, uh, based, uh, they were focused on the minimum existence was the principle. What is the smallest, smallest modern architectural unit, uh, ar uh, apartment unit that brings the benefits of modern architecture to the most number of people? In 1933, a meeting of the International Congress of Modern Architecture, they got on a boat in Marseille, France, and they sailed to Athens, Greece. And in, while they were going to Greece, they hammered out a set of rules that extended the logic of the minimum size apartment uh, they, they started at the apartment, they scaled up to the apartment building, and then from the apartment building to the site planning of the apartment building to the traffic management surrounding the, park, uh, the apartment building, the zoning rules, and the regional transportation. So <coughs> they took the logic of minimum existence and they extended it from the apartment architectural scale to the urban scale in a set of 129 rules, I think. And that became the Athens Charter. But what was happening in 1933? How much was being built in 1933? Not much. Great Depression. Hitler is on the rise. World War II happens. So in 1945, we're looking at the cities of Europe have been annihilated by uh, bombing, either by the Allied forces or the Germans. Uh, so the cities of Europe have been devastated. We, the architects and the governments of Europe, need to quickly rebuild Europe. Uh, the United States is generously offering us tens of millions of dollars to rebuild our cities. How do we rapidly rebuild our cities? If only there was a plan for how to rebuild our cities, thank you, Le Corbusier, and the Congress for the International Congress for Modern Architecture. The Athens Charter becomes the blueprint. It's published in 1943 in a book form with a few alterations, and becomes the blueprint for rebuilding the cities of Europe. And about the same time, uh, in the US, <coughs> we are bulldozing the slums, and it becomes available for, so here's, here's two slides that are lined up. This is um, before 19, or around 1900, and this is around 1970, the same neighborhood. And so um, the, the job is to bulldoze all of this and build the Zeilenbau oriented uh, public housing of Lower Manhattan. That's where I lived when I was in architecture school. So everybody good? So this was a quick pass through the material that we had last summer. From here, it's a, a little bit newer. So um, in the 1960s, a group of architects, younger architects, members of the International Congress of Modern Architecture, noticed that the cities built according to the principles of the Athens Charter were really suffering from their inhumanity. They, were, they turned a cold shoulder to the human occupants and really made life much more miserable for normal people. So they started to propose some <coughs> counter principles upon which, so they critiqued the Athens Charter modern city 
and they started to propose alternatives. Corbusier was not uh, such a bad guy. He encouraged them. He said, listen, I want you guys to feel comfortable. Why don't you guys take over uh, the International Congress of Modern Architecture? So for the 10th meeting of Siam, so for Siam 10, which they used the Roman numeral X, uh, he said, why don't you take over and so that these young architects from all over Europe and elsewhere uh, became known as Team 10. They were the team of architects, the younger generation that ran uh, Siam 10. And here are the principles. Patrick Geddes was a biologist and um, in the tradition of the Crystal Palace and the Garden City, he was also one of the most important urban designers uh, of the early 20th century. He took the principles of the valley section where there's an ecological pattern that some resources, the, the mines, some resources are mined from the mountains. Uh, the forest is cut from the lower slopes, the hunters, the shepherds, and then the agricultural activity of the valley plain, and then the cities um, and the fishing and the towns tend to happen in this valley section. And so that principle was embraced, um, was embraced by, better save my battery. Those principles were embraced by Team 10 and used as an ecological basis for the planning of cities. And in a similar spirit of a biological scientific experimentation, they looked at patterns of human settlement throughout history and what works and doesn't work in urban form. And they, through the study of the vernacular townscapes uh, produced throughout human history, they proposed this type of planning where there's a hierarchy of human experience where uh, Instead of, and I know this is a problem in the undergraduate studios, where you guys talk about public and private. Does that ring a bell? You talk a lot about public and private? What about the shades of gray of the semi-public and the semi-private and the shared spaces? Do you, do you get into shades of gray in public and private? Some? Well, I would encourage you to push that whenever you can. Uh, and that is uh, an inheritance. We have inherited this idea from Team 10, <coughs> where there, we, within the home, there are private spaces. The bathroom is the most private space, bedrooms, dressing areas, and then you have the, the slightly more public areas of the kitchens and living rooms where you entertain people from outside the home, then collections of homes, have the capability of bounding shared spaces that are shared amongst households that then branch into larger and larger shared spaces until you get to large civic centers where everyone in the town. So these shades of gray become very important aspects. And so they identified, instead of the four functions of cities, um, which under the Athens chapter, you would have uh, dwelling, right, you remember this, working, recreating, and circulation. Those are the four functions of the, of the radiant city. And uh, circulation is high-speed <laughs> motorways. And so, you have these three distinct zones and then the high-speed motorways that take you between those three things. And Shazam, that's how we got to the automobile landscape that we occupy now, where in the state of Florida, the typical household makes 19 automobile trips per day in a typical household in Florida. If you need to go to work, get in the car. School, get in the car. Uh, buy a loaf of bread, get in a car. Uh, meet a friend, get in a car. There is no avoiding uh, the car as the first and last step of every activity 
outside of the home. And that is a direct result of the urban form that we have produced in the implementation of the Athens Charter. Team 10, anticipating this problem, said instead of the four functions, we shouldn't be talking about separating four functions. We shouldn't be designing uh, for these four functional segregated spaces in our cities. We need to replace these four functions. Forget about that. And instead, design the four scales of human association. We associate in our homes and neighborhoods. We associate on our streets. We associate uh, with other humans in our districts and we associate with other humans at the scale of the city. These are four distinct scales of human association. Architects have a, done a pretty good job about the scale of human association within the single family unit. The apartments and homes, check, we're pretty, we're pretty good at that. We need to work on these other scales, is what the message of Team 10 is. And of the scales that need the most attention, they said the street is the one where we need to really, this is where we can make the most progress. That was true in the 1960s. It remains true today. And this is where the action is now in architecture. <clears throat> and so they uh, used pho photographic collage to speculate on how modern architecture might do more than simply produce housing, but produce streets in the air. Remember the streets in the air idea? To produce public streets in the air, or semi-public streets in the air, where people could associate. And so they were using the methods of, of photo collage to produce these designs, where in the midst of the block, off the street level, off the ground level, because remember that was still given over to parking and traffic. So raising the humans up off the ground, <coughs> putting streets in the air as part of the housing uh, ideas. And so they did this, um, in particular they did it a lot in England and the Netherlands and in France. And so they started to plan these elevated pedestrian realms in the downtown areas of the cities. Um, and so they produced a lot of these types of architectural interventions in cities. And this is one of the more famous uh, visualizations. Marilyn Monroe and I don't know who that is. So now we get to uh, the punchline, which comes right up to the present of what's happening. Um, in the 1980s, kind of